You don't see even the mid cult getting, forget lefties, you don't see anybody in the middle even getting quoted anymore. It's always um, people whose positions are well known in advance. And, and you know, to have that in my old newspaper makes me free. Um, but you see that more and more. And then you see there's something very important. Um, obviously, um, we all can jump on Putin all we want. Uh, but he's opened up the door right now that uh, I, I just assume Obama will go through. He might not. There's a tremendous uh, war going on against Iran. And to the point where Rouhani goes home. And uh, he's met by uh, some people, a dozen, who threw eggs and shoes. And this is, makes big news in the press. And there, even though the fact is, as reporters in the New York Times, they did note that there were a few hundred people saying something else. But what nobody says is, hey, since when can you throw eggs and shoes at the leader of Iran and walk around? <laughs> nobody got punished. Uh, the last time I saw somebody throw a shoe was at our democratic country, Iraq. And the guy who threw the shoe at, at uh, George Bush was beaten on the side, would have been killed, I think, obviously, uh, if it hadn't been for the exposure there, and was thrown in jail. So there's a lot of stuff out there for us to do more with that we don't do. Um, but in general, uh, as critical as I am about the press, and you know I am, um, uh, it's a much tougher world we live in because of the surveillance. And how we get to that, and how you deal with that as an issue, is really hard. Um, in, in general, it's easy to say, the perfect answer to say, I was at a conference in London about this with the, uh, the Guardian people, and the issue was, you know, they're cracking down, the Guardian has backed off, as you know, quite a bit. They're not running any of the Snowden stuff about the GCHQ, the uh, Communications Headquarters, the, the NSA of, of England. And they're, they're sort of backing off on some stuff. Um, they, they, you know, in a, in a perfect world, you'd say, one could say to the press, hey, go and write as much as you can Violate, just go walk on, walk on everybody's dongs on this stuff. Just do it, because the guys that are breaking the Constitution, are, they're the ones. They're the ones. But is, do we have a Supreme Court that's going to carry that? If it gets to the court, these issues, I doubt it. So it's a tough, it's a very tough situation. And uh, um, the only other thing I would say is uh, I speak a lot on campuses, and um, uh, I'm seeing malaise. I don't see much there. I see more faculty and local people than I do students, and that's also a big problem. It's cyclical, in, but the, 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 the campuses of today, with some exceptions, are really tuning out. And I think it's because it's, um, as you say, I, I think the, the, the vote, the con I talked to somebody who, who uh, went to some of the BS hearings they had on Syria and gas, and he came out a very, 12 terms, and he, a smart guy, and he said he came out dead set convinced from what he heard that Bashar had done everything, delivered the gas himself in a helicopter, probably anything you want to say, the president get away with. And he said he went home to his district and was absolutely going to was intent to vote the bomb tomorrow. And of course, he turned around within a couple of days. There is a tremendous sense, and how do you capitalize it? This sort of in this, uh, if you will, from top to bottom sense. Um, it's not just that they're against, uh, with all due respect, it's not that they're just against the war, it's that they really don't trust what they're being told anymore. And how do we, how do you capture that in a movement? I don't know, it's very complicated. But um, uh, uh, you're not going to get much help from, from the mainstream press because, it, and you would, you know, I always say, even when I worked at the New York Times, if there's going to be a social movement, I mean, being inside the New York Times, we'd be the last to know about it for six months. <laughs> There's a distinct ISO fight with Noam Chomsky. We always wanted to blame the New York Times. I said, okay, we don't worry about them. They're, they're lost on this, some of this stuff. But, but it's, it's, there's something there. There's some way of connecting that we'll figure out. If, if we can, some of, if some of you people here at this conference can, can do the algorithms, <laughs> Uh, to use an NSA word, to, to figure out some way to connect with this mass discontent and lack of trust in foreign affairs by our leadership, because it's been a disastrous dozen years. Um, uh, I don't see it yet, because there should be a mass movement about drones. It shouldn't be, you shouldn't have to fight as hard as you're fighting. I mean, it's, it's you know, what goes on, what's going on is insanity. So period, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> I can use my protest voice. Uh, yeah. These microphones are both. All right. Um, so 
I'm Carl Levan from American University, and I want to lay out a little bit how Mark Raskin and I came to define the national security state, to give it some, uh, some definitions, some shapes that we know what we're talking about and what we're not talking about, so that we can relate the state to the citizen. And then, you know, maybe briefly reflect a little bit on uh, what secrecy means for truth and what truth discovery means for activism. So in terms of the national security state, uh, we had a series of conversations for a couple of years, and Cy Hirsch and many others took part of those conversations, and we brought in a wide variety of people. We did not just bring in activists. Um, Marcus was calling on Stanley Sporkin and uh, the general counsel of the CIA and people like that to sort of ask, what, what is this thing and what isn't this thing? And one of the big issues we were grappling with was, you know, does the national security state, has it acquired a persona? Is, does it have a life of its own? Um, so there were four things that we uh, came up with, and one is organizing for war and limited war. Two is an effort to control the public sphere, um, and I'll talk about that. Three is, of course, a concentration of authority. And fourth, this attack on individual rights that we've already heard a good deal about. So in terms of organizing for war and limited war, um, one of the key points is that the distinction between war and peace have disappeared and become so blurry that you don't even know when the state is preparing and planning for war at all anymore. Um, so during the Cold War, uh, the seed was planted in this regard with the building and maintenance of nuclear weapons, which we now know cost over $5 trillion and have even really noticed. Um, and many of these weapons, as Joe Cirincione has pointed out, still stand at the ready. They're still um, theoretic, not, not theoretically, but in reality, uh, prepared for use. And so this part of this ambiguity uh, about planning, preparing, and waging war uh, is, arises due to the limited wars and due to uh, the shifting technology of war. Um, so not just the economic infrastructure for national security purposes, I mean, Medea properly referred to the milita military industrial congressional complex, and of course we all, I think most of us know that congressional was originally going to be in Eisenhower's phrase, and he sort of crossed it out at the last minute because he thought he wasn't going to be able to take on Congress as well in calling it that. Um, so, so that's one set of issues. Secondly is this idea of control of the public sphere. And by that I mean a shared space where ideas are debated and policies take shape. So in the national security state, the government has an active role in controlling information and actively shaping public opinion. And this is not something new. I mean, this is something that goes back uh, decades to the birth of the public relations movement. But what I want us to reflect on is that is to think about secrecy both in bureaucratic terms and in cultural terms. So here's a couple of pieces of information. So OpenTheGovernment.org, this coalition last week, released this great report, which um, updated us and provides us a sort of um, a, che a checklist of where we stand on a number of things. One is for every dollar spent on declassification right now, the U.S. government is spending $200 keeping secrets. <laughs> so 201, there's one ratio to keep in mind. Mandatory declassification requests have declined 27%. So after a certain number of years or for certain criteria, which a number of people around the table can tell you a lot more about than I can, um, certain documents just automatically become declassified. And those documents in that category has significantly declined. Since the Whistleblower Protection Act uh, and reforms went into effect in 1994, there have been 236 cases decided against whistleblowers and three in favor. So here's another great one, 236 to three. And um, so, uh, you know, the attacks on the leakers rather than the content of the leaks is a scenario that we're all very familiar with. And, you know, perhaps in, during the discussion, uh, Cy Hirsch can reflect a little bit on the New York Times report just a couple of weeks ago that the, this leak on the Al-Qaeda plot in August apparently did more damage than Edward Snowden <laughs> leaks to national security. And, um, and so uh, the secrecy system, the, 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 the culmination of all this is that we get excited, we get stimulated, we get motivated to take the streets when different kinds of scandals erupt. And what this really is all about, in my view, is acclimating us 
acclimating the public to the idea that not knowing is an ordinary part of existing in a democracy. That, it's even, that not knowing is even a virtuous sacrifice in the name of patriotism, in the name of national security. Members of Congress do this every time they take an oath. They did not used to take oaths to uh, swear to uphold national security, and that's something that was brought back in the 1990s. And, um, and I invite any inspired bloggers or journalists to, um, to dig up the, me the members of Congress who actually still refuse or don't even bother to take the oaths because they think it's silly. Um, it, but it's problematic, of course, in a practical sense because uh, any notion of democratic, our notion of government, of dem democracy, the people's democracy, requires and assumes some kind of informed cit citizenry. Concentration of authority. So this is especially apparent in the executive's ability to wage war, but it's manifest in lots of other ways that we might not connect together all at once. Um, my baptism by fire on Capitol Hill was NAFTA, and the debate over NAFTA and fast track trade negotiating authority which um, was all about getting Congress to delegate to the president the free hand to make this enormously, enormously important decision about the future of uh, conditions of trade. So the War Powers Act was supposed to be um, you know, our key tool uh, intended to explicit, assure explicit congressional assent before any sort of long-term military engagement, and it's had precisely the reverse effect. It's 50 years, 40 years old this year, and it's had precisely the reverse effect. As Mark Raskin has argued, it's given the president a free shot every time he wants to go to war. And what we've seen within the concentration of authority and this expansion of war powers over the last several decades is pretext, preemption, and post hoc authorization for war. And you get all three of those. And all three of them have become acceptable alternatives to public debate, replacing necessity, proportionality, commitment. For all of the uh, flaws that we would find with the first and the second Bush administrations, one of the really important, interesting things that happened in the first Bush administration, perhaps mainly because the Democrats still controlled the House of Representatives and the great Ron Dellums was the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, is that going into the Gulf War, there were eight full days of hearings in the Armed Services Committee on sanctions, diplomacy, and war. And there was a vigorous debate about the pros and cons of each. That does not happen anymore. And it's, if it does happen, it certainly doesn't happen within the public uh, discourse. Um, individual rights, fourth. Um, the American idea of the citizen rests on some balance between rights of the individual and whatever we see as the legitimate authority of the state. And I don't have to tell anybody in this room that individual liberties were radically compromised decades, decades before 9-11. Um, in the 1990s, under the Clinton administration, the number of wiretap intercept applications went up 36%. In the 1980s, uh, like uh, the Snowden disclosures and many others, um, the uh, domestic spying operations on the Central America Solidarity Movement were exposed not through vigorous congressional oversight, but through um, an accident uh, within files at the FBI that were seized and made public, and uh, Congressman Conyers discussed this in some hearings. In other words, the oversight process then failed as well. So um, in the post 9-11 world, and a couple people have talked about public opinion, there has been this uh, occasional acceptance by a, a so-called rational citizen that some kind of deference to authority is okay, that some kind of deference to the government is okay. And um, what Shahid and Medea and others um, are doing is diffusing that myth and attacking that myth and re-empowering citizens with the ability to make their own judgment. Part of this deference is be has come into play, as I view it, because the state has become so specialized that within the national security state there are great elaborate divisions of labor within the government in each office has some sort of turf, and what they mean by turf is really an area of expertise. And again, that area of expertise becomes something that intimidates citizens into believing that they don't have the necessary tools to make a judgment about what it is their government is doing. That's a lie. 
And we need to look, about, look at this in non-obvious places, too. If we want to understand critical thinking and form critical thinking about drones, we have to start in kindergarten. We have to start at the very, very beginning. Um, and I, you know, think about uh, the, the debate over no child left behind and, and the effort to value tests rather than critical thinking. This summer, uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities released this report, um, a bipartisan report called The Heart of the Matter, which said that um, practical education um, has come to replace creative thinking and that America needs the humanities to have good citizens. And if we don't end up with this, and what I think we'll end up with is not just the apathetic students on campuses that uh, Cy Hirsch is worried about, but the vocationalization of our campuses, where students are trained not to think, not to be involved, not to be good citizens, but to be good worker bees. Um, and so um, the National Endowment for the Arts in 2007 found that half of American adults will not pick up a novel in this given year, in any given year. And the rate of college students um, had been even greater. Meanwhile, the CIA was actually drawing upon novelists and talking to novelists because they needed creative thinking. They knew that if you want to figure out um, how might a, uh, a, um, a security network be breached, you don't just go to the computer geeks, you go to the people who really make a living um, using their imagination. So where do we go from here? I just want to say two things briefly, um, because I think they fit very well with some of the things that the other panelists have said. One, reclaim the narrative of governance from government. This is exactly how I interpret what Medea was saying about redefining and co-opting and reconstructing the word drone. Let's give the word drone its real connotation so that it triggers a different meaning in people every time they see it on the Sunday morning talk shows, every time they see it in the New York Times. Um, and part of this narrative construction is that the way we process information has changed so much in the last 20 years. I think um, among progressives, we often used to think of the way we would, we would react to what the government is doing or not telling us is the omission of facts. You know, this is the Chomsky thing going out to the New York Times all the time. Um, that somehow we were in possession of facts that other people were ignoring or that other people were not aware of. Well, things have really changed and there's so much information out there that what we need is a people's counter narrative and something that threads it together in a coherent way that reconstructs words like drones. Um, so, um, Related to that, just to wind down, uh, the second thing, where do we go from here, is to establish our standards of truth. Um, and you know, she had mentioned the need for privacy, and what I think privacy does is, is it gives citizens the ability to see themselves as something apart from the state. And that's really important because that's the first step in exercising citizen autonomy, and having self-confidence to ex exercise self-judgment about what actually constitutes the truth. And that's the first step in holding governments accountable. In 2006, 85% of Americans said global warming is, quote, probably happening. It's, and it's, in many ways, it's, I think it's gotten better since then. One of the favorite examples that I like to put out there um, to my students when uh, we talk about these, these questions of uh, constructing truth is um, I actually work mostly on African politics. And this summer I was in the Gambia, and many of you may not know this, but the president of Gambia can cure AIDS. Wow, that's great. <laughs> now you're laughing. Now the reason why you're chuckling is because you have a shared common standard for a term for assessing a truth claim. We can do the exact same thing when it comes to deciding where to drop bombs or where to not drop bombs or who belongs in prison or who doesn't belong in prison because we don't hold our government to those same standards when the president says we need to kill so and so. Well, he needs to justify it in the same way the president of the Gambia needs to justify that he's got the cure for AIDS. Great, thank you so much.